all the necessary requirements, I do hereby admit you to the Doctor of Laws, Honoris Causa, and by my authority and that of the entire university, give you the power to do all that appertain to the degree. Congratulations. It is now my sorry. Sorry, sorry. It is now my pleasure to invite the honorary degree graduate to give his acceptance speech. Thank you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of the Almighty, the most gracious, the ever merciful. Chancellor Professor John Struthers, Vice Chancellor Professor Jigani, the outstanding chairman of Mount Kenyan University, Professor Kisharu, Chief Guest, the Right Honourable Dr. Moses Wetangula, Elder of the Golden Heart, Speaker of the National Assembly of this great country, Ambassador Francis Karimi Mathaura, Elder of the Golden Heart, distinguished members of parliament, faculty members, students, graduates, and family members, I greet you in the name of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I hope you are awake and not asleep. <laughs> are you awake? So lunch is to come soon. And it's been a long morning for you and a long number of years. But perhaps a bit of food for thought still can be fill some space after the many speeches that you've heard. The first word I must utter is Alhamdulillah, which is an Arabic world of all grace belongs to God, by the grace of God. Because I don't have the honor to hold a Kenyan passport or to be a Kenyan national. I don't have the honor of being born in the continent of Africa, though I have lived here and worked in the continent for many years. But as a stranger, but as a friend, I was really humbled to receive the invitation to be given this honor and to join all of you on your very special day. I think it's been said many times, this is not an ordinary day. Each of you has a story that is unfinished. 
But an important chapter is coming to an end. But very exciting chapters you can write in the book of your life. And you know your own stories. It's been touched upon that we've had some years of tragedy and unprecedented difficulties with the COVID-19 pandemic. People have been lonely. People have been sick physically. Also, as the distinguished chairman mentioned, mental health issues have been increasingly apparent around the world. And having a university like this, the largest private university not only in Kenya, but in the whole of East Africa and Central Africa, you have struggled and studied and worked hard, taken loans, worked different types of jobs, borrowed from family and friends to earn the right, to earn the right to be where you are today, which are graduates, graduate holders of Mount Kenya University. You should be very proud. So I hope you will join with me in saying Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Thank God Almighty, thank God Almighty that your sacrifices have given the results, which is more than the paper that you will receive, more than the certificate that you have earned, but is a passport to a future. Now, I also had some prepared speech, nicely typed and nicely organized. And then yesterday evening I was wondering, what should I want if I was sitting in your place? Well, one, maybe I would wish that the speaker would shut up and sit down because you want to move on. But I think it's important to take an opportunity that I hope you'll remember as you embark upon the next chapters of your life. The Chancellor said something that I understand exactly what he meant, that life is a marathon, not a sprint. But with respect, I don't fully agree. You see, when the great Kenyan runners are running a marathon or 1,500 meters or 800 meters, 5,000 meters, they know the finish line. Am I right? Am I right? In a marathon, you know when the end is. But do we know when the end of our life is? I can't hear you. Do we know when the end of our life is? So we can't afford to be sedentary. We can't afford, you can't afford, because you are the leaders of tomorrow. You are going to inspire generations of today and tomorrow. You will help build Kenya, build East Africa, build the continent and build the world, inshallah, in a way that is better. Am I right? Is that your hope? Is that your prayer? So the way to work is to realize we don't know when we will meet our maker. How many loved ones have passed during COVID? How many tragedies do we see even on the football field? Football was mentioned. We have seen even very fit footballers, slim and fit, and they have heart attacks. So please don't leave till tomorrow something that can be done today because we don't know when our life story will end. So do good today. Be kind today. The Prophet of Islam, I am a Muslim, I am a member of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. The Prophet of Islam said, even a smile is charity. I go back to COVID. So many people were lonely. 
In Africa, in Kenya, we have family environments. It's a blessing. In the Northern Hemisphere, so many people particularly were so lonely because the societal structure was different. Even people with money, even people with wealth. So sometimes when we don't know the story of others, we don't know the stories of our brothers and sisters, we don't know the stories of our friends even sometimes. A smile, a kindness can really bring light into the day of our colleagues, our friends and our family. So when we realize that we don't know the finishing life of the marathon, whether God has given us the distance of a sprint or whether we have the blessing of health and long life, that our life can be a marathon. What do we chase? Some may say money. Some may say fame. But if one believes in God, or if one believes even in inner contentment, my advice my very humble advice from somebody who has no wisdom, very little wisdom, is to say, serve. If you want to serve God, you must serve humanity. Am I right? So serve each other. Serve each other. Now, in the course of service, some people can earn money. Some people can, in the course of serving humanity, they can get fame. But without that service to others, we are empty carcasses. It was George Bernard Shaw. Do we have literature graduates here for English literature? I think there are some, but they must be reading, not listening. <laughs> George Bernard Shaw said the tragedy of man is that he's a genius tethered to a dying animal. So I go back to this issue, seize the moment to serve. And the other strange thing I will say, because this is a day of celebration. It's a day of reflection also. And what I want to say, please don't run away or turn off. I hope you're still awake. Yes? You know, I find it very strange sometimes people find death a very morbid discussion. Embrace the idea of death. You know, I saw a bumper sticker on a car once. I was driving somewhere in the world and the bumper sticker said, do not take life too seriously. You will not get out of it alive anyway. <laughs> so, if we realize we're not gods, because the infinite possibilities that is there in the chance of life is juxtaposed with the reality, if you believe in God, that only God is infinite. And we have a temporary time on this earth. One is compelled with that vision facing us in the face to try to serve. Yes, we will stumble. Yes, we will sin. Yes, we will make mistakes. But this is why we believe in a God that is compassionate and kind. But if you focus on service, suddenly one can achieve, I think, great things and can be content. Because ultimately, contentment is one of the important aspects if we are to be whole as a community and as a nation and as people. The other thing I would like to emphasize is please realize your own worth. Be self-confident. You know, the world is changing and even the big powers now have realized that the world of the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s are dead and buried. There are batons being passed there's an interdependency that is staring everybody in the face in terms of economic balance of power to the southern hemisphere, in terms of resources of the world. And the old idea, because there is prejudice. There is prejudice in the world. 
because of slavery, because of colonialism, because of the darker side of humanity, there is prejudice. But one can counter it not only with love and hard work and focus, one can counter it with your own realization of who you are. You know, India is moving at a very fast pace, but they have a caste system still. The United Kingdom and many other countries, they are well known of having the old class system, not a caste system, but a class system. The chairman said something very wise, many things wise, but one thing he said is, don't look at who your family is or your background is, be your own background. This is a time when economics means that if you have something of value, speak up, speak out and deliver it. Because there has to be a competition of ideas in the marketplace, in every university, in every business, in every society. And the best idea must flourish and must win. Now, because we have, I saw on the left here, we have uh, the School of Pure and Applied Sciences, I wanted to recall uh, a small anecdote. I had the privilege when I grew up to know a very great scientist, Professor Abdus Salam. He was the Muslim world's first Nobel Prize winner in theoretical physics. He got it in 1979, and just a couple of weeks ago, the main library at Imperial College London was named after him, the Abdus Salam Library. Now, why am I mentioning him? Not because I know him. I knew him and respected him, and his son is a friend and all of that, but because he was a champion a real champion of diversity. And in Trieste, in Italy, they have founded, a, they, he founded a, a center, it's called the United Nations Abdus Salam Center for Theoretical Physics. And he wanted to bring people from the African continent and from Asia and Latin America to study physics. Now what I'm saying is, please understand it's not limited to physics. There is a very famous American scientist called Professor uh, James Jim Gates. He was President Barack Obama's, on his scientific advisory board, he was the first black American to be the president uh, of the American uh, Physics Society. And he wrote a book, uh, gave an article, and he's written about it. Even the United States Supreme Court have cited it in terms of diversity. And he gave a talk about what Abdus Salam taught me about jazz. Now, we had wonderful musicians from the choir of Mount Kenya. Do you agree? Now you're falling asleep again. Did you not like their music? Yes or no? Yes. yes. So what the scientists said, Abdus Salam said that when people only had classical music, they enjoyed classical music. They didn't know that they were poor. But when the African Americans started breaking those rules of percussion and instruments and moving it in a different direction, jazz was created. And when people saw jazz, they said, wow, we would be poor now if we lost jazz. Abdus Salam and Professor Gates and all of you, I'm enjoining you to realize that when the African voices imbue, whether it is science or the arts or literature, ever increasingly, you will transform the sciences and the arts and the music in transformational ways. Now, one of the themes of today, of course, is climate and technology. At the International Criminal Court, of course, we focus uh, mainly on uh, 
uh, anthropocentrical uh, issues. We're dealing with crimes against individuals. But I think if one is looking at the world at the moment, there are two major threats that you're going to confront. One, of course, is the risk of nuclear escalation. And the other is the environment, and the environment I was, want to, to speak about. Next year, God willing, I will be producing a policy paper on environmental crimes. Now, as has been touched upon, this is something that you live with. The speaker mentioned, the respected speaker mentioned, this is a farming community. You see it in the rains, farmers see it in, in the rains. Mount Kenya itself, the glaciers are melting. The effect is profound and what is felt in Kenya, one has seen floods in Pakistan, one has seen the threats to Pacific Island states by rising um, sea levels. So we have to take proper uh, measures right now and using technology is a very important part of it. But when one looks at technology, I do want to, this artificial division that has come across sometimes between, say, lawyers and investigators, between, I agree completely, psychosocial, trauma specialists, and computer specialists, is disintegrating. And I think this is not only at the International Criminal Court. The depth of knowledge is so deep now. There are so many subspecialities, even in the same field. Sometimes we run the risk of not seeing the wood for the trees. And this is why the cross-fertilization of ideas is so absolutely critical. At the International Criminal Court, we're doing it by building partnerships with universities. In my last mandate, I partnered with Stanford University to bring in psychiatrists and psychologists in terms of the crimes, the awful crimes of the most un-Islamic state, ISIS, so that we could actually deal better with witnesses uh, who've been heavily traumatized. This requires psychosocial understanding. In terms of massive data sets, social media, on the internet, you can't deal with it by analog means of review. We need to use artificial intelligence, machine learning, technical experts. So these are the opportunities that are with you. There are challenges of change but it is a misnomer to be concerned by it. Many of you who've studied economics will know about Thomas Malthus. There was a Malthusian theory that if the population of the world grew, there would be just completely starvation in the world and the world would end. But man's God-given ingenuity to innovate, to raise and deal with challenges has led to the exponential increase in knowledge around the world. You have had the privilege to dip into some of that knowledge, but I think as other speakers have said, that's part of life's journey, to keep on learning and keep trying to uh, improve and learn things. But this interdisciplinary approach, I think, has a lot of advantages. Yes, it's a global market, Kenyans are not only the best in the world at athletics, your minds are absolutely brilliant. I've had the opportunity of meeting so many Kenyans. And all over Kenya, two things have struck me from all communities is the kindness, the humanity, the gentleness, and the hospitality that I have received and people that I know have received. But it's also their discipline, hard work, willingness to study, and a hunger for, uh, for, for knowledge. So yes, one can go and apply for jobs at the International Criminal Court. You can apply for jobs in the United Nations. You can work in the African Development Bank. You can go to Germany and France and the UK and United States. But this is a great country to build. I'm also very cautious and advise the country in relation to the brain drain. Sometimes the best goes outside that have studied and learned. So this country has unlimited potentials, and it is really down for you to fulfill that potential. So going back to the environment and my mandate, I have always been 
really in awe of the youth that have really put the environment on the front pages, the front agenda items of politicians around the world. They're not all environmental scientists, are they? They're not all PhD holders in climate change. But they realize, you realize, your children will realize, your parents are seeing it, that the environment is absolutely critical to the survival of the species. It's too important to leave only to the scientists. In the same way, justice, we need to follow the footsteps of the environmental movement. It is too important to leave to the chief prosecutor of the ICC. Justice is too important to leave to judges of the ICC. It is too important to leave to the just judges or prosecutors or defense, even of Kenya. Justice is the God-given right of all of you. Am I right? And this is your history. I had the honor of representing members of the Kipsigi and Talai community. And all communities in Kenya came together not so long ago. 1963 was independence, correct? 1963, a blink ago, this young, young country with old, rich traditions. One knows what the Mau Mau suffered, what the Kipsigi and Talai, or the Maasai, every Kenyan, your parents or your grandparents will tell you stories or will experience it. The racism that underpinned whatever good may have come in some parts of colonialism, the idea of racial superiority having any part to play in the world, the idea of white highlands, this compelled justice to triumph, that gave you a flag, that gave you the beautiful anthem that was sung at the opening of this proceeding, and that gives you now a blank piece of paper that you can write your own futures on. So yes, every moment is difficult. Economic job markets around the world are difficult. Technology is moving. But as I said, the idea that things are sedentary that things are static is an illusion because we are moving. In the same way the moon is moving around the earth, the earth is moving around the sun. Molecules are in perpetual motion. So my late father, once when I was starting out and I applied for many jobs and I was rejected. I was maybe too cocky. I thought, oh, I'm so good, I will apply for some jobs, they will give it to me. And I applied and some interviews and second interviews and then rejections. And even when I got a job, sometimes I went to my late father and I used to call him Abaji. Oh, this is not happening like this. And he would basically tell me, get on with it. He was a, from Pakistan, he was a Pathan. So I want to recount one saying from the Pathan that I would like you to remember because I found it myself very helpful. He used to recount to me a proverb, which is as follows. O oh, eagle, because I believe you, many of you in the crowd, in the audience, many of you graduating class of 2023 are eagles, not sparrows, eagles. The saying is, O oh, eagle, do not curse the wind. It is not there to push you down. It is there to make you fly even higher. I'm sure your sacrifices and those of your family to date that allowed you to get your robes, that allowed you to do your admission courses, that allowed you to get admitted to this university, to pass your exams, that suffering, that difficulty polishes you, makes you brighter, can make you shine so that you dazzle. So when those dis difficulties come in life, don't get demoralized. Realize the future is yours. The future of the world depends upon you and people of your generation. And I think the last message 
Please don't leave it to your children. Collectively, the very senior leaders behind me, together with you, we have to come, I think, very importantly to this realization. We should not assume there are yet future generations to come that will solve the failings of this generation in this square, in these marquees, or in this stage today. If we realize that certain issues, whether it's the environment, whether it's having international institutions that are fit for purpose, whether it is making justice more equally apply across the world, of yours will be bright, will be exciting, will be honorable, will be full of integrity, and the future of this country will be greater still. And whenever your own marathons end, whenever our own marathons end, at least we can say we ran the race to the best of our abilities. I congratulate you on this finish line of today, and I really pray very sincerely you do great, great things for the world. Think big, believe big, and you will be great. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.